Hi, I'm Dee Dee Leiber, and I'm one of the co-directors of Upstate Films. I'm here at the Star Library in Rhinebeck, observing social distance with Thelma Adams, who's been helping us with our virtual cinema introductions, and Richard Abramowitz, who's been providing some of those virtual movies. Um, and one more coming up, he's the head of Abramorama, a small but so close to my heart distributor um, that we've dealt with for many, many years. Richard's been in a lot of places, but I think he's landed in the right place. Thelma's been in a lot of places too, and now we're all here in Rhinebeck, the place to be. In 1975, my girlfriend was a year older than I, was still in high school. She You were went still to in high school, 1975. Huh? She okay. went to Bard, and I came up to visit her and uh, came right to Upstate. And then the next, but I can't remember what I saw that time, but the next, the next time I came was 76. I was at school in Binghamton. I hitched across the state. I uh, got one ride. Uh, these very kind folks opened up the door to their Volkswagen van. Smoke billowed out uh, <laughs> as if it was less t uh, fast times at Ridgemont High. Exactly. I climbed in. It was a time. Drove across. Uh, they dropped me off right by Bard. I met my girlfriend. We went right in to see uh, Don't Look Back. Don't Look Back. And there was a Lambert Hendrickson Ross D.A. Pennybaker short before that. I can't remember the title of it. And we walked into the theater and I sat down right next to the people who'd given me the ride. So there you go. That's what, it, I mean, it's a hometown theater. Small did, town. Small town theater. Did you have one, did you have a theater that you went to when you were growing up well, or when you were a teenager? Uh, I went to, well, I was an usher at the Fine Arts in Scarsdale. I lived uh -huh. nearby and uh, uh, my friend's father owned it, uh, but I was a busboy at the deli next door and I plied the manager with corned beef until he gave me a job. And then he realized that he wasn't getting any more corned beef because I was now an usher and not a busboy. But I worked as an usher at the Fine Arts in Scarsdale from I think 15 or 16 through the rest of high school. So you've spent a lot of times in theaters. I know I grew up in San Diego. We had the Unicorn Theater. We had the Ken, which I, you know, in closing. The, is closing, but that was like my hometown theater that, you know, when I learned to drive, that's where I went. <laughs> you know, a lucky man, right? I, I also saw a lucky man in California, but in L.A. In L.A. So for me, especially living in San Diego, it was always the, the, the art house theater was always the community. And now we're in a situation where we're living in an area, upstate New York, that people are flooding into that really needs community, like community arts. And I'm curious what you think about when we look at, when in the pandemic, when we look at art house theaters, will they survive? Yes. How? And how many? And how many? You know, there, uh, I'm sure Steve could speak to this better than I, but so many are on the margins and, and they're, uh, they're more mission-based than profit-based. And so many are 501c3s and non nonprofits right. anyway. And they exist uh, to provide community and a place for like-minded people to see films and discuss them and where ideas develop and conversations happen. Uh, and uh, uh, I wonder how many of those that are on the margins where uh, they, they, that they won't be able to make it through, where people whose wealth has been, the benefactors whose wealth has been affected by the, the, the economy now, when they start making choices about how they spend their money, their, their, where they put their philanthropic dollars, uh, what's going to happen to the theaters? What happens to the audience? What happens to the older audience, the mature audience, as we politely say? <laughs> uh, are, you know, at what right. point are, are, are folks going to feel comfortable coming back in and sitting close to each other? And if not, which theaters can survive uh, with a checkerboard seating arrangement where people are distant from each other? Right. Um, it was interesting, there's an article about the impacts in Vulture, about the impacts of the 1918 pandemic and how you saw that initially people didn't go to the movie theaters, 
But ultimately, they wanted a social experience and they came back to theaters. But there's a big difference now. Alternatives. There are big. Do you want to talk about that? Talk about the alternatives. Well, uh, you know, there's a, a virtual cinema phenomenon happening now where distributors are putting their films through cinema portals and people are buying, you know, I, roughly a $12 ticket to watch a movie uh, online that they otherwise would see in the theater. Um, and uh, I, I mean, I, I know that it, it makes sense and I know a lot of the theaters are doing it uh, with the intent of maintaining the community and the connection to people. I don't think people are making a lot of money doing it. I'm not sure how well it serves the films. But to get back to the point, that is a roundabout way of doing it, is if, you know, you can watch Netflix for a really long time and never get to the test pattern. You know, yes. You know, it's, <laughs> it's a bo- endless. It, 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 there's, there's no end. It is, it is literally a black hole, an infinite density of right. programming. So what, what are the things that drive people to go to theaters? There's a certain awareness that has to be created in order to get people to go, to leave their home, and go to a movie theater. And I'm not sure that that's, there's an effective way to do, that we have found yet an effective way to replicate that sort of PR and marketing engine while people are at home. Right. And people, but we also are sitting at a point right now where people are living in fear, you know, and anxiety. (laughs) (laughs) And, you know, as my husband always says, we'll see, like, we don't know what's going to happen. And yet talking to you, I think, well, one of the things I know, one of the reasons as a film critic, you're all, you're like a different, you yeah. know, you free movies, always going to the movies, going by yourself, going, you know, it's a social event because you know everybody who's there. But I think that when I think about movie going, often you go with people in your family, you go with girlfriends, you go with boyfriends, there's a social aspect. Are we, what is that, you know, dinner in a movie, that thing that's the classic date night in America what wh- where is that going to be because sitting on the couch eh, is not the same as being in a public space especially if your parents are upstairs exactly no I I, I agree <laughs> no I think there's always going to be a, a compelling reason to leave the house for on a day to have that special event and I think those that population is going to go back sooner there they don't seem to be as vulnerable they also, their brains haven't clicked to the point where they actually have any fear mechanism. So, yeah, you know, they're, they're, they're fearless. They're fearless. They, right. you know, there's no sense of mortality. So right. they'll go back. I mean, well, I don't want to go into the rabbit hole of the clips I saw of people in Alabama on the beach saying, hey, you know, you got to go sometime. Um, <laughs> but that fatalism. Right. Yeah. Um, We're not there. You got to go sometime, but you don't have to court it. You don't right, have to, exactly. you know, pursue it aggressively. Right. Um, don't poke the snake, as I, we say. <laughs> I think, I think, I think that population will go back. That that doesn't concern me as much as the population that I've always served with my films, being my age. I mean, I've right. been doing this for uh, this is my fortieth year of doing this in some form or fashion. Yeah, great. <laughs> <laughs> that and a nickel. <laughs> uh, and uh, I've always managed to squeeze through by uh, getting involved with films that appealed to me by and large. The, the equation being that if I like it, and I think there are enough people with similar taste who I could appeal to, and the dollars and cents are there, then that's a business. Right. But my population is now older. I mean, I could get involved with films for a 14-year-old, but it's like buying a gift for somebody. I like plaid. Do they like plaid? I don't right, know. I'll exactly. buy and see if they like it. They can always return it. But so in, you're in sync with people who are now, I wouldn't say aging out. Okay, boomer. That's, you know. <laughs> okay, boomer. But I would say, to me, my mother is the typical, like, I got my art house going from my parents, my late father, my mother, you know, and she's still an art house attender, but now she's not leaving her house. Right. So does she have Criterion Channel? I mean, seriously, how yeah. does she? Well, she, fill you know, that? she watches a lot of mysteries. She has, but the she thing has BritBox or she Acorn, has, you know, <laughs> or Acorn, or you know, she has Netflix, and there's plenty. You can watch a million mysteries on Netflix. Um, 
But I do think, as someone who enjoys watching, and the great thing about Netflix and Acorn and all of these things is you, it gives you access to international films in a way that art house theaters have not been, you know, that American theaters haven't been showing as much. So that's a positive. But after a point, and I will say, after this point, I really want to go out to the movies. Like, I want to go out again and be engaged. I know that there's a danger. I know that we're going to have to be careful. But I'm trying to figure out ways that, you know, talking to you, ways that will bring people into the theaters at some point. Well, one of the things that I've been doing for a long time uh, and actually started a company specifically to do this is to create an event that cannot be experienced at home on your flat screen or in your dorm on your laptop, which is a movie plus, a movie plus a conversation, a dialogue, a performance, a Q&A, something like that, that requires people to go there. My whole business basically now is set up on event programming. I did, there wasn't a name for it when I started doing it. It was basically because as a, as a small, at, for many years, sole proprietor, I didn't have the resources of either money or staff to compete with, you know, uh, Fox Searchlight or, right. or Focus, even right. if I had chosen to. Right. Um, and so I developed a, a, a system of doing basically one night events. And I was getting a lot of music films, a lot of social impact so what, films. So what's an example of that? Well, Just... um, uh, we did a film called Trapped, which was about uh, reproductive rights in Texas. Uh, we, we've done five movies with the Beatles. We've done movies with Pearl Jam. I've been right. working with Neil Young for almost 20 years. So a lot of these movies have an audience, but they don't have an audience necessarily for five shows a day, seven days a week. They have an audience for 150, 200 people, maybe 500 people. And so if I show it once and have a, an encore screening, I've fulfilled, I feel, I've satisfied the, the real audience for it. I'm mm -hmm. not going to really build a new audience for Neil Young at this point. But his audience is going to come out yeah. for this stuff, and they're one, dedicated. Tuesday night, can do I can do a, a you know a seven o'clock show. Can't be too late. <laughs> Gotta be in bed, and they can they can you know I can fill 150 seats in any city in the country. Everybody's happy. The theater's happy, especially if there's a bar. Music films and bars. The the exhibitors right. love them because even if it's not a concert film, they treat it like it's a concert film. Right. So stuff like that. Social impact films. Um, where we're, we're doing like Parkland, Parkland, Rising. Parkland Rising next week. And that's week. coming, what, how, what, how is that rolling out? We are doing, um, we're doing uh, a, a Facebook Live sneak preview, basically. It's a massive screening on Facebook for free. We have 35 gun advocacy, gun, gun control, or I'm not even sure what the term would be, gun control advocacy groups mm -hmm. participating Katie Couric and Will I Am are uh, executive yeah. producers. And so Pearl then, Jam has a song in it. Yeah. Dylan has a song in it. I mean, it's got huge, great pedigree. So the social platforms that will be promoting it are enormous. It's going to be on Pearl Jam's YouTube channel. You know, I mean, it's going to get Crazy an enormous, egg. enormous amount of access. And we're going to go from that uh, to a transactional VOD, a TVOD uh, um, access. So basically, we're having a really big. Word of mouth screening on the basically the world's biggest movie theater, Facebook. Right. And then we'll do probably we'll do an encore screening if circumstances require, and then we'll go to TVOT where people can pay a certain amount, and part of that will go to some of the uh, uh, activist organizations. And when it and when it happens, when you do it that way, and it's so it's on everybody, every all of these organizations that have Facebook audiences. It, they share it on their major Facebook page, and then it... it Will I Am has something mm -hmm. like 54 million followers on his social platforms. I mean, and that doesn't cost anything. for. Right. I mean, so it's an extremely cost-effective way to market a film. Okay, but so on, then on the back end, what do you, how Everyone, do you get a back here's end? Here's what happens with, with, with sneak previews. Either mm -hmm. everybody hears about it, not everybody sees it, um, or people see it, and then they tell other people to see it. And then that's where the transaction comes in. And a lot of the films that we work with, the profit is not necessarily financial. You know, we're dealing with uh, social impact issues where awareness is really mm -hmm. the function of, of our work or uh, with some of the musical artists, it's working with the labels to create an event to promote the work. 
uh, if a band isn't touring, it's a way for them to maintain a relationship with their fans. So we have a different model that's not entirely dependent on box office. Right. Which is really convenient when, you know, when, when really, if, if the idea is to raise the profile of something, we can do that through marketing. I can promise process, but I can't promise results necessarily. Financial results. Right. And what about, when do you think you're going to go start going back to the movie theater? Well, I'm, I'm adhering to Pearl Jam's ethical okay. position, which is when it's safe for people to congregate, we'll start doing things that facilitate congregation. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> it's my pleasure to sit with you, Thelma, at socially distant. <laughs> and to support Upstate Films, which is Always. our local art house theater that we love. I have my 45-year badge <laughs> for Upstate. Thank you. 